on this episode of Pick Rich's Brain, my guest is the one and only Michael Knox. We're talking about the early years with Jason Aldean, the nuts and bolts of songwriting, and artist versus singer. Drummer, percussionist, author, composer, songwriter, producer, professional speaker, actor. Rich Redmond has left his mark on thousands of songs, including over 21 number one hits, over 30 years of been there, done that, wisdom and knowledge in the Nashville music business. This is Pick Rich's Brain. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to episode 9 of Pick Rich's Brain. This is a podcast. It's a web series. We talk about all things music, motivation, and success. And I'm beyond excited to have my fantastic guest, Mr. Michael Knox, brother. How you doing, man? Thank you. Welcome to Crash Studios. We're live this in Braniac, Tennessee. My first time here, too. Yeah, and this is great to have you, man. And everyone can see, like, back here, this is a cool little project. I have my uh, laminates from the last backstage passes from the last 20 years. Years, and a friend of mine framed him up finally. That was on the to-do list for 20 years. Michael. First thing I noticed when I walked in. <laughs> um, so I figured today we'd kind of talk about the business of songwriting because it's something you're you're an expert at. You go way back. Tell us about where you're from, the initial attraction to music, and how you got into the business. Yeah. Well, I, I was actually born in Macon, Georgia, and um, my family moved to town when I was two years old. My dad was an old 50s rock, you know, kind of rockabilly artist. Who was that? Buddy Knox. Okay. And they moved to town in 68, and um, um, he was offered a job to kind of be a part of Capital A&R and things like that. But um, then him and my mom parted ways, and he moved to Canada, and we stayed here. Oh, yeah. So I grew up in Nashville, and um, once I graduated college, couldn't find a job. So I opened. Now, what did you study in college? I studied advertising and marketing. Okay. And um, um, couldn't find a job, so I heard about this thing called song plugging from Bruce Birch. And um, he offered me a job, and I started song plugging back probably in 91. And um, then I opened my own song plugging company, which was the first kind of song plugging company in Nashville. And I've uh, been doing that ever since. Had so you ten, were first on the scene? Had 10 cuts my first year okay. and one number one with Bruce. And um, Dobie Gray from Drift Drift Away yes. was my other writer, and yeah. it was uh, it was that's how I started. That's wow, how it all began, and then Gary Overton went to Warner Chapel in '92 and offered me to come in there and uh, kind of be with him and co-run that company with him and Tim Wilkerson. Wow. Okay. Um, and now for the neophytes out there, tell everybody what song plugging is. Yeah, song what plugging is. is I, I would I would be the salesman for your songs. I would be the guy that would go to the record labels, A and R people, producers, managers, and I would try to get them to like your songs, like you as a writer. Or I, I'm selling it like you know you sell a can of spaghettios at the you know on TV. So I am your salesman. You know, so my job is to go. Get your songs heard by everybody. I love that. So you're an extension of the song. So the songwriter is busy being creative, and then they, they take their demo. They get a demo done. They hand it into you, and you can say, they say, run with this. Yeah. Just tell everybody about this song. Well, and you want to you want to, you want to know your market real well, and I'm sure you'll talk about this later. You want to know your market so you, you know who you're pitching the song for. Each label has certain artists, so you'll be like, man, this is great for George Strait. This mm -hmm. is great for... Uh, you know Zach Brown, or this is great for Jason Aldean, and and you you got to know your market, you got to know what's going on around you, so you know who to pitch the songs to. So it's my job to also be a fan of my market, so I can go out and and get these songs heard by the right people. Yeah, and I mean, that's everything is your relationship with the right people. I mean, you are a song man. I mean that you are an expert in that. Try to. And I love your technique and one of your techniques of choosing songs. I think you told me this is you would I don't know how many songs you get for a Jason Aldean record. We Not get about 10,000. We get 5 to 6,000 through that last, you know, 8 months of process. And then you whittle that down to a shorter and shorter list and then you cruise around in your car and you listen and you listen and you yeah. listen and then whatever you wake up <clears throat> with the cold sweats in the middle of the night or singing the melody yeah, the next yeah, morning yeah. over coffee, you're like, short list. Well, my job is to make sure Jason doesn't have to listen to too many songs because you can easily get caught up in 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 songs, you know, and you, you might miss something or whatever. So my job is to narrow it down to about 30 to 50 songs tops for him to kind of go through and pick his favorite 15. And, and then he'll have some songs, too, that he'll throw in the mix as well. So... We probably have, you know, probably 22, 23 songs on our final comp. So that's what we're taking in the studio for him to pick his 15 songs from. Amazing. So maybe we got a little, that's very, that sheds a lot of light on the subject. We got a, a little ahead of ourselves. For those that don't know, Michael discovered 
a very young Jason Aldean, maybe in 1996, 1997? 98. 98. 98. And I met both of you in 1999, yep. which is a whole other story. Yes. But you're from Macon, so I think music is in your blood because we're talking we're talking Little Richard, we're talking Otis Redding, we're talking the Allman Brothers, your dad. Yeah. Um, Capricorn Records. Yeah. Now, your dad's uh, the song was Party Doll? Yeah, Party Doll. But he was a Texas act, but he moved in the late 50s. He moved to Macon, Georgia to marry my mom. And then he had TV shows and stuff like that there. So he had singles and things out of making as well. But later, you know, later on. But, yeah, the Almond Brothers is the big boys. And yeah, we just were on the road the other day, and we got to see the big house. We went after all these years and yeah, went yeah. and visited. We had a nice tour of it, got a picture outside. That was really, really fun. So maybe to just tell everybody, talk a little bit about how you discovered Jason and started this process, and then you are transitioned to uh, being VP of Warner Chapel, and that's when I met you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, um... I was at Warner Chapel at the time, and uh, my grandmother lived in Macon. She was getting older, and so I wanted to find something to do in Georgia so I could go by and see her, and um, Warner Chapel paid for it, of course. So um, I actually found um, there was a gentleman from the buckboard that kept hitting me up to come see this talent show. So I just hooked, signed up for that, drove down to Atlanta one Friday and saw the talent show Friday night and Saturday night. Jason went on number 18th. He was the 18th artist out of two days. And um, it was probably about 10 o'clock at night, and it was awesome. It was everything I was looking for. You know, I'd been looking for a country rock guy for a couple of years, and um, it, you just couldn't find it back then because they were, you got to remember, man, we were in the Hat Act phase. This is 98, you know, so we were in the Hat Act phase. We were. The Clint Blacks, yeah, though. Clint, I mean, Alan it was Jackson, very, so. it, it wasn't rock, you know. Now, Garth. Garth had a rock show, but he wasn't a he wasn't a, an aggressive country artist. You know, McGraw was more Texas country, and Chesney was a little more you know kind of very radio country. You know, and those things those guys are great, but um, I was looking for a little more of a Motley Crue. You know, kind of a guy to oh, shake. Oh, you got it, one. Yeah, to shake it up a lot more. <laughs> but you know, but in order, you know, so Jason was down there singing, and he was in his show. He was you know during his little six song set. Um, it was very aggressive and very traditional, and he was selling both of it. And that's what you got to find. You got to find believability. So it's more in the artist's voice than it is songs. So and Jason was perfect. He had his hat, his big belt buckle, and his his shirt tucked in. It was you know he was a he was a country music fan. So it was perfect to see that. So I went up and talked to him. He didn't didn't know who we were, which was great. And um, so we started building a relationship. And over that year, I, every every three months, I would go see him. I would go meet with his band. I would send him songs. I would drive down and watch him perform. It kept getting worse and worse and worse. Um, um, so I just brought him to town, and we just. You mean the quality of the bands he was playing? <clears throat> the just, young guns, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, it just you know the the they lost their PA at one time, so they had to rent one. So that that show sounded horrible. Then they had to they had to um, you know the band had to learn some songs, mm-hmm. and and um, they didn't learn them well. And, you know, then Jason would forget words. So I just said, man, this is taking too long. So I'll just bring him to town. And yeah. um, I brought him to town. We went well, there's to, a huge talent pool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we, we went in the studio and cut about five things. And I said, yeah, this is what I want to work with. This is who I can help out. Then he got a deal on Capital. Yeah, he, we got deals early. We got got deal on Capital um, um, pretty early. And then we lost that. And then we, um, you know, uh, um, Stegall over at MCA was really wanting to sign him. Then he got let go. Um, a lot of situations like that were happening. Mark, Mark, Mark Wright was digging him at Sony, and then he left Sony. It was like everywhere we went, that person left, and it became this joke. You know, we did so many showcases. Where even that, before we came yeah, along, yeah, you yeah. guys did a lot of showcases. And that's yep. our joke: is you know, we got our record deal on our 40th showcase. You know, with Broken Bow. So. Yeah. Fantastic. And then not to put too much focus on, you know, uh, what happened after that, but you met a a, a younger Tully Kennedy, yeah. and then that, then yeah. you met a younger Kurt Allison. I met and, Tully yeah. through his, his uncle, um, Roy Hurd. Yes. And, um, Great song, right? um, you know, so, but Tully was going on this love boat cruise ship thing. So um, right when I met him, I don't know, you know what it I'm was talking Disney about? Cruise yeah, Lines. Yeah. yeah. You know what's so, funny is that me, Kurt, and Tully all were offered that job. Yeah, I didn't we know We all that. would have That's met each awesome. other on the high seas, but we waited till he came back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because he came back, and, and then we started clicking more. So then we were cutting up, and I brought him in there. And then I said, man, i got to build a band around this kid that I'm working with. And I said, I, you know, the, the guys I have around here are session players, or they're a little older. I said, I need some kids that just play rock music and... Tully goes, I got this guy, I got this guy, I got this guy. So we did that showcase tryout 
thing at SR where we had probably 10, 15 musicians come Was in. I being auditioned that day? Yes. It didn't, it didn't <clears throat> feel like it. You were the third drummer yeah. that came in. So, um, um, and uh, and Kurt was driving in and, and you came in and it was a good fit. Everybody I didn't even know fit. it was an audition. I just was like, I got this. And you did have it. <laughs> oh my God, we had fun. And then that started this period where we were doing so many showcases and we were trying new material and trying to find that perfect set for him. And we were we were doing the Johnny Cashes and the Wise and the Hicktowns and the Amarillo's yep. guys. And we would do these showcases and the suits would come out and be like, I don't see it. I don't hear it. And, we're, and those songs all went on to be number yeah, ones yeah, yeah. or the, top fives. These were all our... Uh, his, first, his showcase for four years ended up being his first record. So... Um, all those songs that everybody said we don't have hits we don't have you know the you're too rocking the, the guitars you know too many guitars why ain't there a still or, or a fiddle in the band or anything like that so it was neat to see that happen because mm. it was justification for us because we knew them songs were hits yeah and then what was your while you were developing Jason which was a great like uh, uh, day, evening activity your day job yeah. well, what were you doing at Warner Chapel at Warner Chapel I was in charge of their artist writer development so I was the guy that would go find the artist, develop them, try to get him a record deal, find the songwriter, develop him, and try to get him cut. And there were some, there were some early acts, the, the Danny Lees and the... Yeah, I had uh, um, uh, J.D. Myers, Danny Lee, um, Emily West. Emily. Um, you remember Emily? Yeah. And um, We did know, the showcase and, at yeah. uh, Douglas Corner yeah, that got I, her signed. I have the poster. Oh, and um, then, um, um, you know, and then Jason came along, and a lot of focus went into that because that was so unique. and. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a lot of little things like that that were happening during that time. And songwriters, I was really developing a lot of songwriters at that time, like Marv Green. Me and Jeff Stevens were working a lot together. Um, uh, you know, I, you know the, the, I mean, I, I can name a hundred songwriters at that time. But it was um, that was an exciting time because there was a lot of a lot of talent in that pool, from Wendell Mobley to Vicky McGee to whatever. We were having so much energy in that building. John Rich, you know, I signed him, yeah. and, and I signed Gretchen Wilson, and you know, to kind of be part of John's team and all those things blew up and started happening. So it was a really neat time to be a part of all that. And then um, remind me when the transition was from your day job of working at Warner Chapel, developing Jason to becoming a full-time producer. Um, Warner Chapel fired me oh, in yeah. 2002. They sold... That was a good thing. They sold Warner Chapel um, in 2002. They let Tim go first and then they let me go second because I was number two. And... Um, um, and then after that, you know, you just had to restructure what you were what you were planning on. Jason Jason didn't have his deal yet. We were just in the ballpark of getting his deal. So all that happened at the same time. It's kind of like when y'all left Jason and came back. Mm -hmm. Y'all left to get in Rushlow, and y'all ran that circle, and you came back right when his radio tour hit. Timing it was is all, everything. Every, so this timing yeah. was amazing too. Like you hated, I hated to leave Warner Chapel with all the work I put in the company, but um, right when it happened, six months later, Jason. Jason got his deal. We started doing some things, and it started happening. And it, it probably gave us a better time to focus on his career and what he was doing. You right. know. Now, now to celebrate all these years later, we're working on record eight and what nineteen number one singles or something yeah. like that. I mean, nineteen twenty um twenty seven uh, twenty seven singles, I think. And nineteen singles. of them went number one. Nineteen number wow. Love That's it. crazy. And I have to thank you very much because uh, you've always believed in, in, in me as a recording yeah, musician. Yeah. And you continued to hire me over the years. Just like, come in and play Shaker and Tambourine on this uh, this Cross and Dixon <clears throat> record. And the lead singer from Alabama, come in and do that. And then yeah. Josh Thompson is doing a record. And you kept the lights on for many, many yeah. years and still do. But that was the thing, too, is that we were changing to a drum loop world. But it was important to stay as organic as possible for it to be believable in what mm -hmm. you're doing. That's what... But you're a great rhythm guy, so that was the that was the key to having you playing shaker and all that. It was it's more believable when you can feel it instead of hear it. It's a fun it's a fun thing to nice icing in the cake to have in there. But yeah, thank you so much. And same yeah, same players all these years, which is great. It's a it's a family. Yeah, yeah. You know when we show up every two years, every year and a half to do a record, we show up to Treasure Isle and the the same gang is there and the we have the same coffee mugs yeah. and it's 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 but so that, fun. But, but don't forget the all the part of that development process with Jason. Um, was building the band around him that made sense because you, we tried other bands and it wasn't working right. But when you found the right band, you, Tully, Kurt, 
we had Adam Schoenfeld there playing some. We had Smith Curry playing steel. Mm-hmm. We all these guys came from showcase rock bands, and yeah. but they but they knew what country music was. They knew our town. They knew it wasn't like they were rock guys and hated country music. They were they were guys that played rock that grew up that grew up in the in, in you know in the South. They learned how to play and country. They under, and they understood yeah. country. Yeah, music. don't let so, Tully, Tully Tully fool you. He knows a lot of country songs. Yeah. I've done some straight ahead country gigs with Tully, and the, the boy can play country music. Well, he lead bass lead bass country. Country. So, but um, but our thing too is, is but the, but y'all were such an important part of that that development process. It was as as important as the songs is how they were played. And well, you know what's really funny is that it's just such a a very strange and unique thing in any line of work in any business globally, no matter what, to have people together for eight yeah. years. Yeah, and it just doesn't happen. And and building a team. Like that is 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 very important. It's it's also even better that that Jason understands how important that is. That that's half the battle too. Is that the artist knowing how important their crew is around them, and he and he understands that you know y'all bring that 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 to his live shows and that and and the studio. And that, I understand that in the studio. That's my job. And and I want people to understand that man. When you got something that works, don't break it apart because one person don't like it. Because we've had a lot of people try to break our our little crew up, and we just didn't allow it to happen. Really? Who are they? <clears throat> that's a, we have such a good time here on a, Big Rich's that's Brain. A, that's a different. Um, that's a different. That's a different show. <laughs> we really do. But no, I mean, what a what a fortunate life we have. I mean, we were just like two weeks ago tracking in the studio. Jason's about getting ready to start the keeper vocals on all the tracks. Last night we were in uh, Virginia Beach playing for twenty four thousand people. I get off the bus and here I am in my home studio with some of my favorite people. I mean, we are very very fortunate. Um, who are some of the other people along the way that that uh, that you produced? There was Josh Thompson. Yeah. There was Cross and Dixon. There was I did Josh um, um, Cross and Dixon. Did Bush Hall. Bush did Hall. Um, um, Frankie Ballard. Yeah, oh, Frankie. Did um, Montgomery Gentry, where I come from. Trey yep. Atkins, Just Fishing. Yep. Uh, you know Josh is um, you know way out here, which I love. You know the and, the Merle Haggard tribute. Yeah, I did the Merle Haggard tribute stuff. Did Alabama. I mean, um, it's a lot, but you know. Over the past few years, thanks to Jason's success, I got to, I, I didn't have to be a producer, you know, producer whore or whatever you want to call it. I didn't have to go out and make money that way. So I got to pick and choose people I love. A and a lot of, sometimes producers get caught up in just producing and they forget to kind of do do acts that they really relate to and they enjoy. So I, I've been fortunate enough to not have to spread myself too thin like that. Yeah. Perfect. Do we have some say, questions? I was going to say, after the, uh, the Chapel Warner <clears throat> Warner Chapel. That Warner Chapel. Yeah. That, when that ended. Yeah. What was your mindset like? Well, you know. Well, I, all of a sudden, I, a safety net was removed. Then what? Yeah, it, it, it was it was dark times. I mean, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, it was tough because you went from making these this huge amount of money to making nothing, and um, and still believing in an artist that you're still buying. You know, um, I'm still I'm still buying him gift cards so him and his family at that time could eat. I mean, he didn't have a lot of money. You know, so it was still changed, baby. it was still an investment. Yeah, and um, you know, so I was still investing in that. But I started a company called CollegeMusicRadio.com. dot com. Oh my god! That oh, that was the it would have been the first kind of independent music download store back in back in that day. It was like oh oh pre iTunes. It was post iTunes. It was two thousand one, two thousand two. Yeah. 2002. yeah. And um, so I started that, and that's where I bumped into Brantley Gilbert, Zach Brown, and all these other independent bands. I found them on this site and was hunting them down and. And um, you know, uh, and and that re revigorated me. You know, I found these artists that were working again, and I was like, "Wow, man, this is what I've been missing." You know, I've been missing people who do it because they love it. We got caught up in a system that you were you were doing it because it was your job, and um, and so that period kind of woke me back up, and um, and then Jason hit, and luckily, that was that's the amazing part of it is that it all happened right when your mind got set. Reset. My God, Michael, I remember the college. <clears throat> and you know what's really funny is that I don't know if a lot of people know this or we want them to know it, but we actually cut Dirt Road Anthem yeah. on Brantley Gilbert. Yeah, yeah. And when we, he was a pop artist. And and um, you know, and, and I still have that cut and Brantley does too, but but yeah, they, they that deal didn't work out on Universal. Brantley actually walked away from that deal. Mm-hmm. And then that's when I talked to Brantley and he was like, Man, he can I would love for him to cut that song. So we went back in and and cut it a little bit of a different way. Yep. And um, and it was awesome. Amazing. But that was a life changer. I mean, that one, She's Country, you know. Big Green Tractor uh, you know, was some... It was some... Amarillo Sky, She's Country. 
you know, uh, Big Green Tractor and, and Dirt Road Anthem, my kind of party. There, there's a handful of songs that just changed changed us. And the future for you, um, Michael Tyler. Yeah, that's your. Yeah, we product. got. I'm doing Michael Tyler. I manage Michael too, so we're in that management phase of, of working with him and trying to build that independently and see where that goes. You know, um, and Michael's to me. I mean, Michael wrote somewhere on a beach. He he wrote a couple of things on the new record. That he's having just some great cut. successes. Well, somewhere. he's yeah, he's yeah. he's a true songwriter. He's a, the descendant of Jimmy Rogers, the father of country music. So it's neat to watch him because I've been working with him since he was 13. And, yeah, you you, know. you 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 believe in the slow burn. I was thinking <clears> to <throat> myself, like I'm fortunate enough to be playing on some of this Michael Tyler stuff or all of it, and it's like, oh my god! I was looking through some pictures, and I was yeah. like, that's six years old. Yeah, yeah. Holy <laughs> cow! I mean, you're you're never in a rush, yeah. and you when you believe in something, you are there. Well, that's well, that's how yeah. you get the true cycle of it. You if you just cut a song and put it out, um, we have a lot of artists that come and go, and I think it's because they're they they think a hit song can make an artist when it really needs to be the right song. You know, um, we'll make an artist, and you know, but then we're doing Tyler Rich together. Too Tyler right Rich, now. yeah, and that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. That, that's on Big Machine, and that's awesome. And Tyler's great, and you know, and Michael and Tyler are the kind of the new guys I'm investing some time in, and then Jason's new record, which is going to be awesome, a monster. Yeah, this this record is coming together a lot better than the past couple of records. I mean, this this record, the songs and everything. Jason's in a great mind mind space, you know, and he's really taking chances. It's awesome. Mm. Now you were mentioning before we went live about the difference between a singer, a songwriter, and an artist. Yeah, yeah, or a singer and a sing and a you know and an artist. Yeah, I mean there is a big difference between a great singer and an artist. I mean, you know, a great singer can sing anything, and it's the phone book, and it sounds great. But an artist has a unique way of selling what they do, and and that's what I try to find. I try to find artists. I don't, I, you know, I love great singers, but. I, uh, you brought up the Warner Chapel days. The Warner Chapel days taught me the difference between a great singer and an artist. A great singer can sell a song, but a great artist can sell a career. And and you want a career. You know, you want an artist to have a career. You know, it's like Tom Petty. You know, all the way to to some of these you know country guys like Merle Haggard and these guys. These guys might not be technically the best singers in the world, but they have an artistry about them that makes you invest your time and want to know who they are. Mm. And there's a lot of great singers, and you hear them on the radio every day, but they don't really sell a lot of records, or they don't really they don't really intrigue you enough to go buy the buy the product. It's like hearing a commercial. You know, I love the Slinky commercial, but I don't go buy the Slinky commercial. You, you don't. <clears throat> Yes, <laughs> but you know it's and you know what's funny is that maybe uh, chime in on this maybe as a result of all these fifteen minutes of fame singing competition yeah. shows this whole there's a whole generation that's like my God if I can just get signed get management get a great song I I can skip all these steps and that step is jumping in a van with some of your favorite people and going to learn your craft and yeah. playing those yeah. nightclubs we played those nightclubs on Tuesday nights and Wednesdays when you go in the bathroom and you're like you're peeing in a trough you know you're playing a rock and roll club yeah 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 you know yeah. and we weren't afraid to go do that people are wanting to skip that step yeah. well and the negative to that is um, Kelly Clarkson. Carrie Underwood. The negative of that is that every now and then an artist plows through there yeah. and you're like, oh my God, these people are incredible. But then they forget about the other 20 years that you're like, well, who are these other 18? Yeah. You know, who are these other? And they were just great singers. You know, some of them were just great singers. And, you know, and some of them might be good artists and stuff, but they just, you know, they might not be the best artists that you need to, you know, kind of compete at that time. Sure. Or, well, it's like we were saying last week with Tully and Kurt on episode eight. We'll throw back. Um, when we're talking about authenticity mm -hmm. in the music creation process, and we brought up the Beach Boys, somebody had posted, uh, "Wouldn't it be nice?" Yeah, just the vocals. They isolated the vocals and how incredible it sounded. Yeah, and they yeah. were not Pro Tools too. They weren't perfect, but right. they they were perfectly. In, yeah, they're human. Yeah. yeah, and I think that's probably a lot of what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, authenticity, yeah. Well, sincerity. Yeah. Well, an artist. Uh, what you like about an artist is the grit and the imperfections of what they do. You know, and but sometimes I mean, it's you know, like but but you're forgetting. You know, those guys. Uh, those guys are singing something they invented. That's why it's so great. And that's the difference between singing somebody else's song. The thing that makes Jason so great is that he can find songs he didn't write. That's why the process takes so long. We can patiently wait it out, and we skip over a lot of hit songs. There's songs on the radio right now that were number ones that we passed on because it just wasn't exactly right for him. So we, we, we have that process and that time frame of waiting for the right song. And, and going back to the Beach Boys, I mean, those guys invented that. 
and that and that's why that is so special and that's what you got to find and that's an artist an artist is somebody that's bringing you know uh, uh, something unique to the format Either it's a Tom Petty or it's a even a George Strait, you know, simplicity is best for him. You know what I mean? And 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 yeah, and, and with Jason, it was our aggression. It was our aggression with the lifestyle of small town America and the lyric. And people don't, you know, I get a whole lot of great up tempo rocking songs, but they're missing the lyric aspect of who Jason is, and they don't understand he is a simple small town America person. And look at Amarillo Sky. Look at Big Green Tractor. Even Cheese Country is a guy that could, you know, easily be a Friday Night Football song. You know, mm -hmm. it's a simple process. It's not overthinking the. It's That's not George overthinking. Bulldogs. It. You like apple pie. Yeah. Yep. You know, and, and no offense, the, the greatest artists have a simple way of what they do. Mm -hmm. And if you listen to all of them, I mean, you know, even all the way to the Beatles, they were complex in their, in their, in their productions, but their, but their songwriting was very simple. You know, a very simple process. And yeah. Joko got involved. It is a tough thing, though. It, <laughs> Joko, right? Yeah, for those of you uh, listening or just tuning in off camera is Jim McCarthy. He's hey. my, he's our muse. He's our Ed McMahon. He's keeping hey, us on track. Hey, do we have questions coming in? We do. We've got a bunch of really good ones. Nice. Um, from Ian Keller. I hope I'm, uh, might be Kaler. Hey, Rich and Michael, what do you look for in a drummer when doing a session? <laughs> This is about tracking a song in one or two takes or taking time on a song and trying to come up with a part that really fits the song. It's great hair. Well, well, Rich Rich doesn't look for anything in a drummer because he wants the gig. I want the gig. So, so. But, but, but what, you look for, what you look for in a drummer is somebody that brings a little more of a passion. You know, um, if I want something played perfect, no offense, Rich, if I want something played perfect, I'll, 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 I'll program it. Okay. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. But, but you want something with a little more of aggression and a little more of a, of a of an organic live feel. That's what will set you apart on radio when everything sounds the same. You want your stuff to have a little bit of a different approach. So I can't speak for other producers, but for me, that's what I look for. Somebody that acts like they're playing in front of 20,000 people all the time, you know. That is certainly you. <laughs> and, I'll, and I'll let you know, when, he's, when we're tracking, I mean, he's pointing... His sticks at everybody. He's he's screaming. He's yelling, and um, and that's what makes it work. And if you listen to anything I produce, you'll go, "Wow, man! Why does your stuff have a little more energy here than maybe some of these other people?" It's because of those pushes and those and those attitudes around the studio, and and that goes back to probably what he'll ask later is about my production style. My production style is building building a a rehearsal environment around a recording session. It isn't about me getting in there telling you what to do. I'm not that producer. My, I'm hiring you for, for a specific reason, and it's for your knowledge and what you can do. So if I'm in there telling you what to do, then how are you giving me something unique? So yeah. everybody in the studio has a specific plan and a specific thing that they do really well, and I expect them to do that. So I treat it like a rehearsal. We're in there rehearsing until something feels really cool, and I stop. And then I can I can I can fix it up a little bit. You later. know when you have it. He uh, he knows when he has it. He goes, Redmond, they're gonna track to you because that was the one. And I was like, <laughs> coffee time. But there was you know there was uh, the other day. I think I was like I was being a Miva. I think I needed a, a, a Snickers bar or something. It was later in the afternoon. And I said, well, what do you want? And, he, and you go, well, that's why I hired you. <laughs> <laughs> Figure it out, and then we 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 tried like six times to get this perfect fill, and then we settled on one, two, something, da, da, oh, bah, and then everyone went on beat four, yeah, and it would oh just. But how did those guys know to do that thing? Yeah. And the only way that that we know how to do that is knowing what you might want in the bag of tricks, and then them responding almost in kind of like an Aquaman and the fish kind of thing. Yeah. Do, 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 that you can't rehearse. It just comes from time. Well, and, and also, as you know, my produce, my production style is not one instrument at a time. It's a group. It's a band. Like Motown. And, and, if like you Macon. Can't, and if you can't pull it off as a band, then we probably don't need to be doing it because you're going to have to play it live one day and people are going to hate it if you're doing it wrong. And um, so that's that's our approach to it, you know, or my approach, yeah. you know. And these guys do that perfect. Everybody has a deal, and you know, I got traditional guys in the studio, and I got aggressive young guys in the studio, and we got old school guys in the studio, and all of them together. My engineer's seventy years old, you know, and and, oh my and my drummer is 
25 mm. we have a lot of different ty- and my Brit- I got British I got British engineers and I got and I got country boys playing you know country music and um, and that's what makes it really unique we can kind of get through any obstacle yeah. so going back to what you said how do they know that they're following the energy and vibe of the session and if we do it enough times everybody all of a sudden falls into play mm. It's such a fun environment. It really is. Thanks, Ian. I know Ian. He's he's good. Good drummer. Did I say his last name? The right no, he's good. He's actually one of the buy, one of the first guys to buy my signature drumsticks. Thanks, Ian. Right on, Brent Carmichael. Hey guys, as a young artist with the industry changing every day, is it still possible to achieve the success that you have had with Jason? Um. Well, I, yeah. I mean, you, you can always achieve that if 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 everything lines up right. I mean, you've got to remember we we achieved our part by making it making it sound like Jason that that's our job our job isn't to make it successful our job is to cut it the best we can and and give and give the next step the tools to do their their deal. I mean nobody it's nothing is guaranteed and there's no formula for success you know that's why you that's why Jason is my my fifth act that's why I, I was at Warner Chapel working with the tons of acts you you want to find that one that you go wow man this is an extension of me this is what I. This is an extension of what I do best, and he adds to what I do. So, all I can do is cut it and make Jason the best Jason is. All I can do is make him as believable as Jason as possible. But luckily, I found a guy that I, I felt very confident that he spoke to a group of people that he was one of them. And and I, if you go to Jason's show and you look in the crowd, you see the same person. He's just wearing a cowboy hat, and you know. But if you put a ball cap on him, he's exactly those guys in the audience. And and um, so that that's where my job comes into play. My being a superstar like he is, man, that's just a lot of long hours and a lot of consistency. And that's the hard thing is to keep doing it at a certain level of consistency and quality. Yeah. <clears throat> and so part of that part of the answer would be um, we we do our part creatively, and then there's this whole other back end of the machinery that you need, which yeah. is a manager, a day to day manager, a road manager, a, a, a label, the you know, the publicist. Like you've yeah. got to have these things, yeah, right? Yeah. And our job is to give them something to sell. You know, now they're going to sell whatever they have, but um, but yeah, I do I do feel like that we give them a better product than most and and that's that's what makes us different and gives them because you see a lot of artists try to make it you see a lot of artists fail you see a lot of artists that you don't hear from after one single the thing that sets us apart is that we give them the product that sticks and it's our job to make sure it sticks more than one or two times wow right on yeah this is a great question um anthony grady Hey, Anthony. Uh, says, hey, Michael, what legacy do you want to leave behind in the music industry? I don't know. Sure, that, you already uh, done it. Yeah, that. <laughs> I, I mean, but that's a hard question. I mean, yeah. you know, my dad was an old 50s artist. You know, um, he died broke in a motorhome. Um, Roulette Records was his label. They were mafia-owned. They stole, you know, his royalties. They stole everything. So uh, probably the legacy I'd like to I'd like to leave is that I, I don't do that. You know, I want people to leave from working for me going, man, I, he gave me 150%. And if that's a legacy, I have no idea. You know, I, I I think we changed the format with Jason, and I'm happy with that being the main thing that people remember me for is, man, in, in 2006, this guy changed our format. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm proud. I'm proud to know that if it wasn't for my productions and Jason Aldean, we wouldn't have Luke Bryan, Eric Church, Florida Georgia Line. We wouldn't have this aggression that's going on today we wouldn't have rap and country music we wouldn't have you know uh you know toby keith experimented in it every now and then but we really went there and and really stuck it in in there in a south georgia way and so i'm real proud of, of those things and and i hope that that's something in 20 years it'd be neat if hey man you remember when michael knox and jason aldean did this it would be amazing if that is but the main legacy you want to leave is doing good business and fair business and not taking advantage of artists and stealing things that isn't yours. Amazing. That is a pretty cool legacy just to be part of it. Pretty cool. Yeah. Now, in 2006, these guys came along and changed it forever. We're in the wiki. Yeah. We get a wiki. Yeah. Maybe. Not only that, I mean, with, with the, the style of recording that you do with everybody in the same room, Yeah. using the live band on yeah. the album. That's, that yeah. was unheard of. Yeah, and yeah, yeah, it, yeah, because we, Nashville was a different formula, you know, and um, and and we're kind of getting away from that again. And yeah. I think the only thing that's going to save it is to go back. You know, there's a reason why we're not selling a lot of records, and 
there's just not a lot of different sonics out there right now. Everything sounds the same. Everything's and, getting pretty homogenized. I mean, yeah. a, real, a lot of it does sound exactly the same. I'm like, wow. But you got to you got to get more people involved for it to be different, and that's giving guys like a nobody Michael, you know, like me, a shot at you know at the time. Amazing, amazing. And using a band nobody knew. That's right. Well, we, you know, we got to play on our, our, our Rush Low record, but it sold cardboard. But, you know, it's still, my drumming still holds up, which I got to say, if you're listening, there's a record out there, if you can find it in the used bins, it's called Right Now. And we got great drum sounds, and I was pretty happy with the drumming, but even though majority of the songs, Rascal Flats had passed on. Yeah. And they gave them to us. Yes. And we're like, we'll take them. But anyways. Well, and you spoke to that in the last episode. Yeah, we did. Authenticity with Rush Low. And yeah, yeah. Letting you, you know, Michael letting you guys do your thing. Everything, yeah, that was a big thing. Like, I believe in you guys enough to do your thing. Whoa. That's yeah. heavy. I mean, but but you got to remember, man, the first time we all went in the studio was I Remember You. Yes. Skid Row. We did a Skid Row cover. We did a Skid Row cover, and then I hired you guys to start those playing. Camps. Remember those yeah, camps. start playing the Warner Chapel camps. Yeah. And that was, edu- that was me trying to get y'all to the next level because this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to have a live band that I could mm-hmm. use in the studio. And then I started booking y'all on those writer shows. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember all this stuff. No, this was all amazing. It was a five. It was you and Judy Stakey, and that's how we met Stan Lynch, yeah. who produced all the, the, the Don Henley records. We worked with Robbie Neville. We worked with Jewel. We worked with yeah. the guy that wrote uh, Smooth for Santana. Yeah, yeah. It was like a great learning experience and gave us more time in the trenches. But I also... Booked y'all in rehearsal halls for months. Yeah, we did that. And um, with catered meals. Yeah, yeah and, and that was a big deal. Yeah, at the time. and y'all were broke then, so very broke. We would book rehearsals during Christmas just so y'all could have some food, some food money. Yeah, and you, uh, you were looking out for us. I mean, you really were. But my point being is that all, all that was part of our part of what I was trying to use you, you guys for. Yeah. You know, and and you know, I I knew y'all could do it. We just had to get you to that level of perfection instead yeah. of just jumping ship and using the regular guy who plays it now I wanted the guy who could play it tomorrow <sighs> that's heavy that is heavy and you wrapped the band around Michael Tyler that you believe in as well yeah yeah but we went out and found a group of guys that be- that, that that believe in him and and that's the key is that you know you guys saw what Jason was doing you liked the music and, and you were like wow man we, we don't have to we don't have to go play in another band to get this out of our system. Mm-hmm. We can play in this band, you right. know, because a lot of people don't understand is that in the late 90s and early 2000s, you had this country bands, and then they would go play other shows with rock bands and stuff, you know, and the country thing was their side thing yeah. to make money. Yeah. But the other thing was their passion. Yeah. So the great thing to do is to find a bunch of musicians such as yourself, Tully, Rich, and all them guys, Jack, yeah. all them guys that go, no, I get out what I want out of this too yeah and that was us changing the format yeah it was interesting at the time the format was one electric guitar two acoustic guitars steel guitar fiddle keys lots of harmonies so there are all these bands the Diamond Rios of the world the Lone Stars six guys very light in the instrumentation a lot of vocals and now if you look at bands on the road no fiddle yeah no steel no keys two electrics the only thing I don't the trend I don't like is necessarily is is some guys don't have bass players. All the stuff's on yeah. tracks. Yeah, it's like, what are we doing? We're almost back to Millie Vanilli. Yeah. Well, yeah. well, and that's and that's live too. But but that's some guys. You know, the, the, the trendsetters can pull it off. It's it's the ones that follow that screw it up. Mm-hmm. You know, the guy that invented it, the Sam Hunt that invents it. You're like, hey man, why doesn't it sound bad with him? But God, it sounds horrible <laughs> over here. Right. It's always funny, man. The the trendsetters get too many followers. And everybody invest in the followers and forget about the trendsetter. And, you know, we were the trendsetter, you know. And, and you know, guys like that, a couple of these loop guys, you know, FGL, Sam Hunt, these guys are the, these guys are the, are the ones that, in, that brought that to our format, and they do it great. It's all the ones that are following them that kind of kind of don't do it as well as they do. And they need to quit being imitators and find the thing that makes them those guys. Mm-hmm. Like, what makes you unique enough to do that? And... And that's and, and and that's the key to staying on top is always knowing your strengths and what you do better than everybody else or what you do different than everybody else. Well, when the guys took their little detour back in the early millennium, and you're, I guess you guys are still yeah. moving forward with Aldine, and, oh, yeah. and um, you had other players, I guess, filling in for that time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, this, what what do you do in a situation when you have a drummer who or a musician that's on a session or in a live situation that's not exactly? 
Well, we did what we did then. We we kept looking. You know, you you can't stop the train. So sometimes you're not up to par where you need to be, but you still got to accomplish the goal. So so you're still switch. I mean, we were switching out guitar players and drummers left and right. You know, we were trying guys. We were we were stuck in situations sometimes where you couldn't make a change for a few months. You know, it, it, it you just have to be a manager and and understand that you still have a goal to accomplish and you still got to get there the best way you can. And we knew this was going to come back around after about six months or so. So we were we were waiting for that that time frame. So we didn't really, I didn't really spend a lot of money developing you know, a band again to do this cohesive thing again. I mean, a lot of time was put in these guys and it wasn't that they needed it. It was just, we needed it as a, as a team, as, as a, a group. As a unit. Yeah. yeah. So sure. we needed it. You know, these guys were playing exactly the way I wanted them, but it was everything else about it. But I can promise you, man, Kurt plays the guitar a hundred times better now than he did back when we started. Tully plays, I mean, Tully plays a lot better. Rich plays a lot better. I'm a lot better producer. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, things that have happened because we're around each other we have we have done something where we're the the trust of each other is what makes is what makes that happen so awesome and 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 when you can feel that it's great you know these guys had an opportunity too it, it was i remembered it man rush Lowe was at at our exit end show and and y- y'all were showcasing jason for mark Wright at sony hmm. mark loved him and um Russell walked right back there and offered y'all a gig at that venue. There he was talking to everybody. Whoa. It was at the exit end show. I remember it went like it happened yesterday. There's, there's so many clouds. Yeah, yeah. In there. But but the thing was is that it was that year of us trying to figure it out that made that that y'all went out and got something out of your system too. Mm-hmm. Y'all got being artist out of your system, and you're like, man, I, maybe we maybe we don't want to be an artist like this. Maybe we just want to be these massive you know band maybe want to be this these studio guys I also you know? sold all my video games and donated plasma <laughs> it was a wonderful time yeah uh, hey hey, being an artist is the brokest time you'll ever be in your life yeah it was like mm-hmm. when you're living large when you're like eating like rice burritos it's like <laughs> yes it's Friday night past the pace <laughs> <laughs> New Jersey yes. okay hey so I know that some of the viewers are definitely gonna want to know talk a little bit exactly how the machinery the business of songwriting works a question that comes up all the time is if I write songs I have a passion for this do I have to live in Nashville yeah I, I you don't you don't have to but if you want to be successful you you probably need to be here you know if you if you want to have the opportunity and you want to compete with the other people it's kind of like going hey man I want to race NASCAR do I have to go to do I have to go to Bristol Speedway eventually you do you know <laughs> so if you want to be successful in country music it never hurts you know to come here and compete with all the talent that you're going to bump into and and just being here lets you know the level that you have to be. You know, now once you're successful, or once you get a rhythm, or once you get something rolling, you can always divert your plan and kind of do something. But but if you're starting out, it's important to be here. It lets you know the level that you got to be at. Somebody, you know, um, you know, an artist or whatever, you know, they need to come here just to see how this town works. They need to see the the process of everything. So. Um, I always hate saying, yeah, man, you need to be here. You're not going to make it because there will be one in a million that that can have that opportunity and make it. But as a as a general whole, you know, you need to come here and see the competitive difference. You know, it is it is a game. It is it is very ruthless. And and there's a lot of friggin talent in this town that doesn't get the light of day. And it's important to understand why they don't make it, and, and you should. So, I think it's good. You if being here is like it's like owning a restaurant. <clears throat> Location is everything. Yeah. I mean, it, just being here, I think, is the first step. Yeah, yeah. And then once you're here, you're mixing, you're mingling. Nashville's in such an open community. Yeah. It's it's relatively easy to bump into the Neil Thrashers yeah. of the world. And Neil Thrasher is going to say, "Oh, you're a songwriter." He's at least going to give you a piece of advice. Yeah, you yeah. know, he's not going to vibe you out. Well, These people and just are here. All the writer shows you have access to. And the shows you come and see in Nashville, I can promise you the the quality level is going to be a lot higher than your local town or something like that. And and it's not going to be an open mic night bullcrap. You know, it's going to be something where you might be in an open mic night in Nashville and two of those people have cuts. You know, it's a whole different deal than going down to Gulf Shores and seeing a a local in the round or or something like that. Yeah, the rounds here are 
real. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, you, the, your percentages are the other way around. You know, you might find 20% of the town, these guys aren't really players, but most of it, you know, you're in there with people that have cuts, platinum cuts, number ones, whatever. Yeah, people were asking me about the, you know, the validity of the Nashville Songwriting Association or all that, and I was like, you know, I think the, I think you just need to come to town. You can mix and mingle. It's a co-writing song culture. A lot of people are like, well, that's cheating. And I was like, no, you could be a troubadour. You could be a singer-songwriter and want to do everything yourself. But, you know, pretty much here, it's a culture of at 10 a.m., of at least two people yeah. are getting together. Yeah. Maybe one's great at melody, one's great at lyrics. You, they combine the forces, and you got, like, Reese's yeah. peanut butter cup. Yeah, and, and it, all it is is a discipline, you know. And and some people, you know, don't write songs that way, and that's fine. But you will find that discipline at any 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 schedule you're looking for. You know, you can you'll find that discipline in the. You know, I got writers that don't write until three in the afternoon, you know, and everybody's like, "Wow, it's a set schedule." Well, no, it's not. It's just when they get up and when they get rolling. And if you really pay attention, if somebody's like, "Well, I don't write on the schedule," I bet if you pay attention, you're, you're writing on a schedule a lot more than you think you mm-hmm. are. You're like. Well, I don't write until the afternoon. Well, you're on a schedule now. It's the afternoon yeah. schedule, you know. So yeah, and if you're really yeah. focused, I mean, when I was doing it every Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday yeah. for four years, I wrote at ten and three. Yeah, three days a week. Yeah, and there are business songwriters that operate incredible from ten to five, and they get up and they do their thing. They just seem to work better in that schedule. But then I got younger artists and younger guys that hook up about three, and they'll go until nine o'clock at night, and yeah. or just until they get done. Yeah. And you know, so but you got to be here in town to kind of, kind of see where you fall and what that is. You know, and you know, it's just, you know, it's it's just, it's just how competitive it is. It's it, you, it's important for you to see it. Yeah, you know. I personally think you got to be here. I mean, I just think for anything. I mean, this is where you want to end up. But just the business of songwriting. So a song comes to mind, people jot it down, they've got to demo it. Back in the day, we used to pay a thousand dollars at least a song with yeah. real musicians in the studio. Now everything's doing doing things virtually yep. with virtual instruments and then the plugger comes in and tries to get the song to the right person yep. and then we we get a demo and then we have to bring that demo to life in our own style yeah so that's kind of that's my take on how a lot of things are working yeah yeah i mean and you know publishing is a getting songs to artists is a is a is a is a talent all in it it's a whole industry all on its own you know, while y'all are trying to write and create and figure out how to write a song, there's a whole group of people that are trying to figure out how to get it heard by the right people. Because it's hard to get a meeting with me sometimes because just there's not enough hours in the days to meet with everybody. So you got to kind of work on that relationship and that respect of me going, you know, man, they don't waste my time. They bring me hit songs. Right. And, you know, so that's important. So what, are you, what is your uh, role and focus now at Peer Music? Um, I run their day-to-day operations in Nashville. I'm, I'm, I'm the head of the Nashville office, so my job is to find the writers and you know and kind of help them get to the next level. Hire my staff to help them get there, and um, you know it's kind of the same thing with Warner Chapel. You know, it's just my boss isn't in Nashville. You know, my boss is in L.A. So Pair Music has a lot of offices. Yeah, yeah, we got 27 across the world, and. Um, you know, and Pierre's the biggest independent. You know, they're the founder of the father of country music, the first family of country music, the first recordings, you know, of country music come out of Pierre Music, you know, the Bristol Sessions. And, you know, some of the first blues artists ever recorded were done by Ralph Pierre. And, you know, so Pierre is, that's, that's why I'm working there is my dad's an old 50s act. He was the first guy to write and sing his own number one hit. And Mr. Pierre, you know, is 1927. That's the beginning of country music. And it started with Pure Music, you know, Ralph Pure. 1927? Yeah, jazz was born in 1920. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, at the same yeah, time, was happening. Yeah, yeah. How are we doing on time, Jim? Doing good. We had about, uh, for a full hour, about another 10 minutes or so. Okay, great. Um, Dwayne Hall, this is a kind of an interesting question. Hmm. Can you guys think of a Jason Aldean song that took maybe the hardest to really get it just right? Um, we've had a few of them, you know. I mean, D- Dirt Road Anthem w- w- was an effort. Um, you know, um, more more in the more in the concept of keeping it organic. Mm-hmm. We could have cheated a lot of times, and we didn't. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I, they've all, you know, the way the way we've operated, we've never really had to spend more than probably five five or six takes on something to really pull it together. Now we've had things on the last record and on every record where I say, "Man, y'all come in here and hear what you're doing." And then right when the band hears it out of the headphones, 
they understand that something's missing. You know, it's easy to get caught up in the headphones because you just turn it up and it sounds loud and great. But when you come into a room and you're walking around, you start hearing where the rhythms are being a little bit lazy or off or where the where the chords aren't working right. So, yeah. um, you know, but I don't think there's a song that... Everything we've taken in the studio, we've used. We've never not used the songs we took in the studio. We've never overcut. Um, we've used every tune we've ever cut. So we've been fortunate enough. You know, a lot of my pre, a lot of my pre production is just understanding what Jason can do, and and when you get that process, it's easy in the studio. I'm not in the studio experimenting. If we're experimenting with anything in the studio, it's sonics and sounds. Yeah. Remember, Dirt Road Anthem was just a Cold Ford's demo. It was yeah. just a static drum machine. Yeah, it was a it was, super static drum machine. Yeah, yeah. How do you give that wings and bring it to life? Yeah. Um, that's a great question. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, somebody had asked, let me see if I can pull it up here. <clears throat> can you see, this is Karen Lussier. Hey, Karen. Can you see a European tour for Jason and the Boys anytime in the near future? That would be a, a Chris Parr, uh, Clarence Spalding management question. Yeah, Maverick. And, yeah. and if we do, hey guys, if y'all send enough notes, I bet you can get Chris Parr in here. <laughs> Chris Parr's behind the scenes. He doesn't want to do this. Um, he's missing out on all these nice Persian rugs and yes. uh, Kroger water. Yes. Uh, but, you know, we did play a couple of European countries. We did do the O2 in London and we did the O3 in um, Ireland. Those were, those were good, solid yeah. showings. So, um, yeah, I mean, we'll probably go again, Australia. Do you get a lot of people that come up to you and say, hire me, what are you looking for? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and, and I wish it was that easy. I wish it was, because they're, they're all like, hey, man, try me out, try me out. And you're like, God, man, I spent 10 years creating this. I just don't try stuff out, you know. Um, who, come, who are these guys? Try me out. What? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Meaning engineers, musicians. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Try, try me, you know, it, you know let Ooh, me. I'll pop their head. Yeah, who yeah, are these people? Yeah, put yeah, their head in the yeah, vice. Yeah, it's, it's probably your best friends. But, um. But but I get that a lot, and 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 I I wish they understood how how long it takes you to build a team around something, you know. Mm. And um, and now other artists, I have I have other teams around them. So when I try something new, it's typically not with Jason as much as it is maybe with somebody else that I'm working with and wanting to create something different around them that I haven't done before. Some of your best friends. That is so Nashville. <laughs> You're so Nashville if, behind your back, one of your closest friends says, Why Rich? Use me. Yeah. I and, love it. <laughs> I love it. But, I mean, does that stuff happen? I mean, it happens a lot. Of oh, yeah. I'm, yeah. Sure. I would I'm sure Jason gets hit up on the road to try other producers that are my friends constantly. Yeah. I'm sure. Be like, guy. Hey, look at I got this haircut, and I'm half the price. Mm. But the funny thing is, is that this crew talks a lot to each other. We might not tell it here, but we probably know everything. <laughs> I, th I think I think you're good. Yeah. <laughs> I think you're safe. Time in the trenches for sure. Mm. Well, that's the funny thing is, is that when I first met you, and we did that first vid sing. Yes. And you were talking about Rich spinning the sticks and everything yeah. like that. That kind of energy, and I'm quoting you, makes it to take. Yeah, energy yeah. makes everything in life is about energy. It cannot be recreated. It can only be shared. Yeah, and so we do. We share energy with each other. And if you, oh, man, well, and if you keep thing in a group environment, man, everybody's feeding off something else. You know, when you're doing one instrument at a time, you know, you're really just playing technique. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to play. You know, you got Adam and Kurt challenging each other. You got a steel player. You know that doesn't really play steel. I mean, you know, we got steel on everything. You just don't know it because he's playing something else. He's not really just playing traditional. He's modified steel. the sound. Rust ball, you know, yeah. yeah. And then you're pushing with Tully. I mean, all you. I mean, everybody's competing with each other because all these guys have extremely huge egos, and they Big don't. Time. And they don't want to look bad. Yeah. And they're going. Like, you call and, this chicken? And, and and they're going for it. And they're going for it. You know. And and that's and that's what you want. You know. Yeah. Mm, I've learned to just save space for Tully. Derek Derek Smalls. <laughs> um, so maybe one more question. Uh, you know, kind of uh, all the good ones I think I've used up. Well, yeah. Uh, all the good ones are taken. All the good ones are taken. Well, that's okay. Um, anything you want to uh, kind of promote? Anything you're working on? With anything you're excited about? Any last parting bits of wisdom? Not that we hadn't already talked about, yeah. but, but, you know, the, the best advice a guy like me can ever give is that we always look for individuality, you know, and, and we look for that in a songwriter. You look for that in a musician. You look for that in anything. So... You know, always be a student and try to figure out how that makes, you know, how that fits in your world to be a little different. Let me ask and, you this. What 
what kind of expectation are you experiencing from the new guys, the <coughs> upcomers? Are the expectations shifting? Are they expecting things to happen in more of a compressed time? Yeah, yeah. Well, 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 it's well. We're in a world of a lot of hipsters right now that that are coming into our in our market, and sometimes the hipsters aren't the best musicians. They they know everything. They're great students. They're wearing quarter you know, Yeah, and, and, and they, but, but they, but they might not understand the philosophy of like what Rich said is, is paying your dues and the, and, and the live shows and understanding the team environment and, and building something around somebody else. A lot, of the, a lot of the newer guys I'm bumping into are more geared about them not looking bad instead of understanding your, your goal is to make this artist look great. It isn't really about you. And, and, you know, and we all have a, I mean, you know, trust me, man, I, I would love to be a, I would love to stand out there and say, look at me. But if, if I can't produce Jason to be Jason, then nobody's going to look at me anyway. So my job is to, is to make him the best he can be, you know, but, but, you know, and, and, you know, you wish we had, we wish we had a little more people that might have under, understand small town America a little more. That's all. I'm glad you I spent time in Lubbock, Texas. I did four years in Lubbock, Texas, and it was like. Nothing to do there, really. Yeah. Except, uh, but, but I think play. you also understood that when he got here, it was going to take yeah. a while. Well, you you need to you need to learn that just because you know how to work all the gears, doesn't mean you're the best guy for the job. So you got to give them a little more. You're a good singer, not a good artist. Yeah. Well, and and, that, <laughs> and, and that's the, and that's the thing. You know, you might be the best singer in the world, but that doesn't mean you're you're the best artist. Yeah. You know, you got to have something that makes you a little different. Do you think that pendulum is starting to come back? Um, it, I, yeah, I, I think it does. If it doesn't, then we're sitting in, we're, we're dead in the water. Where, where do you see the industry going with the file sharing and the, the, the streaming and all that? We're, we're just global music making. Yeah. I mean, you know, somebody with a Mac and just, I saw a guy on YouTube the other day just doing this thing in a, in a you know, it was yeah. bonus room. And yeah. Tracks. And, and you know, and, and that's cool. It, and and there's people who can do that, and they'll be fine. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem is too many people think they can do that. And you got to know your strengths and talents. You know, my strength is not. You know, I was an engineer. I was trying to be a musician. I had drum loops. I did, a, but I, I I was smart enough to know what my strengths were, and my strengths were building teams. You know, and 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 I can make anything sound good, but it, it wasn't about making it sound good. It was about making it sound interesting. And making you want to buy it and that was the different process you know we got tracks and everything on the radio that sound amazing but it don't mean it's it doesn't mean it's connecting enough to make somebody run down the street and go buy it you know it, it's easy to record amazingly clean crisp tracks in, in your bedroom yeah yeah it, 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 it's harder to mess it up and and it have a little grit on it that's the hard thing to do these days I mean, that's the truth. I mean, even with online people got the guys with their bloggers on YouTube you could have the worst you know, and I know I bring them up all the time, but Gary Vaynerchuk, who's one of the preeminent marketing guys out there, started making a video series called Wine Library, and the very first episode looked like he was being held hostage by terrorists. Yeah. No but lighting, it, no... It was no it. lighting, he didn't give a crap. And he grew into a multi-million dollar business. Yeah. It's great. He, he yeah. grew his business that way. The tools are there the for everybody. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Value. The, yeah. The, the, the tools are there for everybody. The tools are becoming more and more affordable. The the the, the result is, though, the... the, the the ocean is flooded with mediocrity. Yeah. So to really break out of something, you really have to be special and roll up your sleeves and not be afraid to work. And and uh, maybe, I don't know, I'm sounding old, but there is a generation of people that are really not wanting to put the work no, in. No, no. Yeah, because and, I and, teach these kids. And that is why it's hard to find live musicians because they don't want to go play on the road for 180 days a year. You know, they all act like they do, but then when you hire them and they go out there, they're doing everything they can to get off the damn road. Yeah, and I've got two marriages that went bye bye <laughs> because I was on the road because I have that deep of a commitment that, to. What that's I do. not selling my point that well, but come to Nashville, bye marriage. bye marriage. <laughs> it's like it's like crab fishing. I mean, you know, some guy everybody thinks they want to do it until they have to do yeah. it. For 27 hours. Well, and and no offense, a lot of the I don't want crabs. Uh, 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 yeah, yes. <laughs> Should we end on that? Hey, Zanies, Zanies, I got five minutes at Zanies whenever I want. I'm bringing the symbol. No, I'm bringing Yes. There should, you go. Should we, I mean, how can we top that? But I, th I think we end on, on the crash. <laughs> crash. 
Ladies and germs, thanks for tuning in. This was episode eight of Pick Rich's Brain. Use the hashtag Pick Rich's Brain, no apostrophe on the riches. Send us your questions. This is on Google. This is on iTunes. This is on Stitcher. This is on YouTube. My guest this week has been the one and only Michael Knox. Thanks, brother. Thanks for your time, brother. Thank you so much for everything you've done for me over the years and the whole team. And uh, we hope you enjoy this, and we'll see you next time.